Now, there's two final topics that I want to discuss in our first week of this course, and they are investment policy statements or IPSs and the life cycle. Now, there's a couple of reasons why I want to cover these two topics this week. One, I realize it does seem like kind of a grab bag of topics this week, but these are two very fundamental topics in investments. And so I do want to make sure I cover them as early as possible. And two, quite frankly, a lot of textbooks will start their first chapter covering IPSs or the life cycle or both. So I just want to line up pretty well with them. All right, so let's talk about what an investment policy statement is. Well, as the name implies, an IPS is a statement about how some person or organization will invest their portfolio. IPSs are used in several contexts. Personal financial planners can draw up an IPS for a client. When we talk about IPSs of institutional investors like mutual funds, it's also referred to as a prospectus as well. Now, the IPS or prospectus tells a new investor in a mutual fund exactly how the fund will manage any capital that the investor contributes to the fund. Uh, now, keep in mind that all IPSs are different, but most IPSs for managed funds are going to have the parts that I'm about to describe. Typically, the IPS is going to start off with an introduction. In the case of a personal financial plan, this is going to describe the individual or the family uh, that the financial planner is working with. Next, the IPS is going to have a statement of purpose, and this is going to describe why the IPS exists. Why was it created? After that, an IPS will explain the responsibilities of the individuals associated with the plan. If this IPS is for an individual, it'll describe the responsibilities of the client and the financial planner. If this IPS is for an institutional investor like a mutual fund, it'll describe the responsibilities of the fund manager and any other individuals working for the fund, like analysts. We'll also find some procedures describing how the IPS will be updated over time and how the fund will respond to various events. And then we will always see some investment objectives. Uh, while some of the other components I've listed so far might not appear in every IPS, investment objectives always appears somewhere, usually near the top. The investment objectives describe what the client is hoping to achieve. In the case of an IPS for an individual, this might include being able to retire at age 65 and live on $60,000 a year uh, until age 90. For a mutual fund, this objective might be something like maximizing capital appreciation while maintaining a moderate level of risk. Now, there's always going to be constraints on the client or the fund's behavior. In the case of a mutual fund whose objective is capital appreciation or moderate risk, the constraints might also specify how much risk the fund can be exposed to. For example, can the fund invest entirely in international tech stocks, or should it maintain a diversified portfolio that holds assets in a variety of sectors and markets? The latter is certainly far less risky. You'll also often see a section that details how certain operations will be performed by the fund. These constraints might prevent the fund from investing in stock options or commodities. We'll also see an evaluation and review section that describes the fund's investment results. For a mutual fund, this section will detail the annual return, the quarterly returns, other measures like the Sharpe ratio, and then it'll also specify whether the fund beat its benchmark. The last section is the appendix. And the appendix will often describe the rebalancing policy of the fund. The reason this is important is that some assets in the fund's portfolio will appreciate in value, while other assets will depreciate. A lot of funds rebalance their portfolio quarterly or semi-annually to make sure that they're holding the optimal weight of each asset. A fund might also specify the minimum and maximum percentages of the fund's assets that can be held in any one stock or asset class. To illustrate some of these components, I think it's probably best that I show you an actual IPS. So I've pulled the prospectus of the Guggenheim Alpha Opportunity Fund, and let's take a look. All right, so here is the prospectus for a series of Guggenheim funds. Now, a lot of prospectuses, they'll be produced for a, a number of funds in a fund family. So Guggenheim is a fund family, they'll have a number of different funds, and we can find information on all of these different funds in this one prospectus or IPS. 
here we have our table of contents. You can see a lot of the sections I just described, things like the objectives and strategies. So here we have our investment objective. Guggenheim Alpha Opportunity Fund seeks the long-term growth of capital. So this is a capital appreciation fund. We note the fees and expenses of the fund. And if I go down here, we'll actually be able to see, oh, let's say the, the actual turnover associated with the fund, the investment strategies, so long and short positions of domestic equities and some other equity-related securities. If I go far enough in here, I'll, we'll th see things like the returns, the rebalancing strategy. Uh, I've posted this document on Canvas, so if you want to review it, feel free. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't discuss in a little more detail how a personal financial planner puts together an IPS for a client. Uh, now, the first step is to sit down with your prospective client and uh, essentially have a conversation with them. Your goal as a financial planner is to identify your client's assets, liabilities, income, and expenses. So we also want to know other things like spending habits and how long they expect to be working and investing. Uh, so everything related to their investment horizon as well. Now, a financial planner will identify all of this information and they'll get the client to articulate any long-term financial goals they might have. Now, different clients are going to have different goals. Some might want to retire and live quite well. Others might be more focused on their grandkids' education or buying a boat or moving out of the country or something like that. Uh, every client is going to have a different set of objectives, and it's the financial planner's job to make sure that they are very likely to achieve those objectives or goals. Now, you're always going to want to articulate how much risk the client is going to be exposed to uh, during the investment period. So in addition to specifying investment goals, uh, any financial planner putting together an IPS is going to want to put together uh, an indication of the risk tolerance of this IPS or of these uh, this investment portfolio. If the client's going to have very lofty goals and a long time horizon, they might have a very high risk tolerance. If the client, however, is near to retirement and close to meeting their objectives, they might be a little less risk tolerant. Uh, so we need to adjust their asset uh, allocation to account for this. An investment professional is also going to want to have some investment selection guidelines in this uh, document. So what are the minimum and maximum weights that this it, uh, portfolio can be invested in? Can they, can this individual, this client, have 100% of their portfolio in equity, or is it going to be capped out at 80% and have a minimum equity investment uh, portion of their portfolio set at like 40%? Uh, so this is something that we'll typically see in an IPS. And then finally, the financial planner is going to want to identify, just like in a, a, a funds prospectus, uh, the responsibility for selecting and monitoring investments. Who is responsible for what? And that should be specified in this IPS. So hopefully you can get a sense that these personal IPSs are similar to a, a fund IPS or a fund prospectus. There's a lot of similar elements here. Okay, so uh, let's try a practice CFA question based on what I just discussed. So the section of the IPS that describes the client is the investment objectives, the intro, or the statement of purpose? Well, the correct answer is going to be B. Uh, the introduction describes the client and it outlines what's covered in the document. So uh, who, who are we talking about, whose funds are being managed, and why are we assembling this document? Uh, often the purpose and scope of the IPS is also included in this introduction. Uh, the reason a and C are not correct. Well, A is really just like a one-line statement on investment objectives. C is really more focused on why the IPS exists, but the introduction will describe the client. All right, so let's try one more CFA question. And this is a little different than some of the other CFA questions we've seen, uh, but it, it is the type of question that you see all the time on a CFA question, uh, CFA exam. So you have two analysts. First analyst says a written IPS is part of the best practices for a portfolio manager. Analyst two says a written IPS ensures the client's risk and return objectives can be achieved. Uh, which analyst statement is most likely correct? One, 
two, or both? Well, the correct answer here is A, analyst one. So this statement right here, an IPS absolutely is part of the best practices for a portfolio manager. You would always want to have an IPS. Uh, the reason the analyst two statement is not correct is because an IPS does not ensure that the client's risk and return objectives can be achieved. It indicates what those objectives should be, but it doesn't guarantee that those objectives are actually going to be achieved. So answer A. Now the final topic I want to mention goes pretty well with personal financial planning, and that's the life cycle. Most people want to retire or at least have enough money so they can retire eventually. Uh, in personal financial planning, the life cycle refers to the fact that investors tend to follow different investment philosophies as they age. Younger investors, like yourselves, have a longer time until retirement. This means that you have more time to accumulate capital. Because you have a lot of time to accumulate capital, this means that you can be a little less risk averse, or you can take on a lot more risk. You can invest in high risk, high return investments. Usually, younger investors will hold between about 60 and 95% of their portfolio in equity, and the rest in other assets like cash and bonds. Older, middle-aged investors might have only, say, 20 years at most until retirement. This means they have less time to recover from any large declines in the value of their investments. This means they probably should be a little more risk-averse. They might only hold, say, 50 to 80% of their portfolio in equities, and maybe 20 to 50% in bonds, and uh, some in cash, and some in other asset classes. Finally, we have older investors. And when I say older, I mean older than 60. Uh, these investors should certainly have a very low risk exposure. If there's a financial crisis and they're fully invested in equities, they might not be able to work enough to recover what they've lost. Therefore, these investors should usually have between 30 and 50% of their portfolio in equities, 50 to 70% in bonds, and then some funds in other asset classes like money market securities. Now, there's a lot of rules of thumb that you probably heard that describe how a person should invest as they get older. For example, there's a well-known rule called 100 minus your age. So it, you take 100, subtract your age, and that's the amount that you should have in equities or the percentage of your portfolio that you should have in equities. Uh, there's also the one-third, one-third, one-third rule, which says you put it in, oh, equities, bonds, I think real estate. Uh, but every investor is different. They have different goals, different time horizons, different income, different expenses. Therefore, uh, not every financial rule is going to apply to every investor. However, over time, investors should generally allocate a larger portion of their portfolio to assets that are less risky. All right, so let's try one more CFA question. Emily Rose is willing to take risk when investing. She's young and has a secure, well-paying job. Her risk tolerance will most likely be characterized as A, high, B, medium, or C, low. Well, the correct answer should be A. Someone who's young should typically be more willing to take on a lot more risk because they have a longer time to retirement. And then also take a look right here. She has a secure, well-paying job. What this means is that she probably is not going to need to withdraw any money from her investment portfolio anytime soon. So she can afford to take on a little more risk. And so that's why the answer is A. Okay, so let's summarize. An IPS is used to specify how an organization or an individual should invest their assets. The IPS should reflect the needs and the objectives of the client, so each of these are going to be unique. And personal IPSs are developed after a financial planner has had a conversation and the with the client, and the client uh, has given them information enough to determine their assets, liabilities, income, expenses, and objectives. So that's all related to our first point today. Uh, the second point is that the individual's life cycle indicates that individuals should become more risk averse as they age. So with that, I'm going to end this video, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.